67% of blacks were in the same boat. We're seeing the material needs of working people being crunched, being, uh, being denied because of the policies of big business and by the political party, by the political parties who are implementing the very agenda of Wall Street that has us thinking then, what about that historical moment? The historical moment of Obama winning in 2008. This black man and this beautiful black family occupying the White House in a town built by the hands of slaves. And so we have to be clear that Obama has represented and has carried through the agenda of Wall Street. He has become an enemy of the working class and poor, and particularly folks of color, and particularly black America, who voted for him 97%. But we have to say, I can spend all day and all night talking about Obama. You know all the figures. But just to give a couple highlights, or hi, uh, uh, highlights of his administration, the question of trespassing and surveillance, the question of immigrant deportation, the question of public education and the charter school movement, the question of public sector jobs, and particularly, particularly the attack on education. We've lost 7,000 jobs within educational uh, education field. And this is only in, in the month of July. Overall, dating back to 2009, over 300,000 jobs within education have been lost. We've seen unprecedented attack and cuts on a federal level and also state and citywide. But also, this imperial, uh, this imperial president who feels very comfortable wearing the robe, the drone attacks in Pakistan, the greater encroachment into Africa. We cannot be fooled by the wolf pack of Romney and Paul. I'm sorry, of Paul Ryan. The lesser of two evils, and we must keep in mind that Obama represents the most effective evil for the ruling elite. But while you're paying attention to the wolf pack of Ryan and Romney, don't be led back into the foxhole with Obama. Because I think what Malcolm said in 1964 is correct in 2012. That a wolf and a fox is both canine. Both belong to the dog family. And that we are living in a very abusive relationship. You vote for the Democrats, but you get nothing back in return. You get high hopes. You get high-sounded high rhetoric. But what you do get is the agenda of Wall Street. And in many ways, as Jared Ball, the professor out of Morgan State and contributor to Black Agenda Report, stated, and he's absolutely brilliant on this point, that you can only have an Barack Obama, you can only have a Reverend Al Sharpton, you can only have a Michael Eric Dyson, you can only have the black misleadership class that we have in front of us, because you had to assassinate Malcolm X. You had to silence the voice of Dr. King. You had to eradicate the Black Panther Party. You had to kill George Jackson and Fred Hampton. You had to imprison the young lords. You can't have a Barack Obama and have a Malcolm X type occupying the same space. So in many ways, what does this say to us? We know that the system is in its deepest crisis in a generation. Capitalism is not providing any sort of answers. The material needs of working people are not being met. Profit is the, is the dominant question for Wall Street, profitability. And over the past 30 years of stagnating, stagnating wages, a society in deeper debt, a service economy, unemployment among our young people at 20 to 50 percent, what has been the answer of American capitalism and bourgeois democracy? we've become prison USA. In the second year of the Great Depression, 1930, on a national average, there was 75% of all prison admissions were white, while 22% were black. Now, if you look at the South, it was a little more different. <laughs> but, but in 1992, the first year, of Bill Soul Brother Number One Clinton's administration. 
29% were white, 51% black, and 20% Hispanic. Our youth between 16 and 19, the unemployment rate is at 40%, and just this past summer, they once again slashed summer youth programs. We have an urban school to prison pipeline taking place. And I want to highlight this point. The Board of Education, if we look at the year of 2009 and 2010, 70 percent of students involved in any school-related arrests or cases referred to law enforcement were Hispanic and African American. Black students are more than three times as likely as their white peers to be suspended or expelled. And this is a new report that just recently came out, just over a few days ago, once again in New York. Black and Latino students were collared in 95% of the 882 uh, total arrests, while blacks and Latinos make up about 70% of the, of the city's student body, which is about a million students. The NYPD, on average, arrests 11 students per day, either arresting them or ticketing them. In 2008, 2009, that school year, there were over 5,000 safety officers. Over 80% of the schools, the urban schools in New York, have been of detectives. You're not going to school in many ways. You're going to a replica of a prison. You have more safety officers than you have guidance counselors. Even our most precious babies at the age of six are handcuffed. They don't know how to deal with maybe a, a child that's a, a, a six-year-old that's a little antsy in their chair. <clears throat> so they call not the parents. They don't call a guidance, a, a guidance counselor to deal with the child but they call the police. That pipeline is staging, in many ways, a genocidal stage of mass incarceration. Once again, New York, stop and frisk. Over 600, 685,000 stopped. 88% innocent of any crime, 89% black and Latino. This is deeper than just a question of social control, in fact. This is about criminalizing a whole generation this dates back to the post-Civil War period. Because now you had, you had black labor roaming the country, looking for work. The introduction of vacancy or loitering laws meant to control and corral black labor. And in many ways, if you got arrested, you were brought back and worked for a particular company. Or you were brought back and worked on the land that your forefathers had worked on. This stop and frisk is not a new phenomenon. It dates back to the post-Civil War period. And after Reconstruction, we must be clear about that. In fact, there are more black men in the criminal injustice system than there were at the height of chattel slavery in 1850. We have six million people within the system, either on parole, probation, jail, prison, any other type of uh, uh, institution within, within the structures. We have 2.5 million prisoners, women and men, and women are the fastest growing sector entering the prison system. And we haven't even added in the 300,000 immigrant sisters and brothers in detention centers. We have also had the rise of the question of private prisons. We know that states are having budget crises and that the prison is a heavy burden upon them. And so you would have private, uh, the, the private or prison uh, industry send letters out, and they did, sent letters out to all the states saying that we would take on this, this burden for you. Human Rights Watch states that there are over 300 youth in California prisons facing life without parole. 
California is very interesting because at the beginning stage of World, of world War II, you have many <coughs> African Americans who had migrated to the urban centers, and particularly California was a designated spot because of the rise of industry. J. Edgar Hoover pointed out that we must keep an eye on this, this new developing uh, youth that are coming about, that are growing up in California. The California Youth Authority was a prototype of social control, of surveillance, and of imprisonment. And in, and in fact, many Black Panther Party members had gone through, had gone through the California Youth Authority. <coughs> One, of course, is George Jackson. The U.S. is the only country in the world where people who are under the age of 18 at the time of their crime, serve sentences of life without parole. Nationally, more than 2,500 youth offenders are serving these sentences. Sean Watley, the Georgia State prisoner, pointed out with pr profound clarity that prison is the modern day slavery. It's the large slave plantation. Jobs performed by inmates, firefighting, customer service, landscaping, working in the governor's mansion, all prison labor, as Sean Watley states, all prison labor is done due force, coercion, trickery, threats of punishment, or after punishment is applied. And what we seem to forget sometimes, we talk about, and right, rightfully so, we, we must talk about it, Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo Bay. But a point that even Malcolm X made, made very clear is that what's practiced abroad is developed and refined at home. What is practiced abroad is developed and refined at home. So when we talk about solitary confinement, we have over 80,000 80, folks in solitary confinement. The statistics say that no one in solitary confinement should be there no more than 15 days. But if you know this term that we're going to put you in a hole for 30 days or 60 days, they've already by bypassed the whole question of what they should be doing 15 days and, and get you out. It's a form of torture. It is breaking every semblance of what you, of your touch and your feel, of, of how you communicate and deal with people. You begin to lose that sense. You lose your human abilities in many ways. But isn't this the land of the home and the brave? Which way forward out of this crisis? We are 20 years, this past April, 20 years since the LA riots. Last year was the 10th anniversary of Cincinnati. We saw the explosion of righteous anger and frustration at the non-arrest of George Zimmerman around Trayvon Martin. Babies this small on protests. Fathers and mothers bringing their babies out in hoodies. Spontaneous movement and struggle. It is because of that that there was even an arrest of Zimmerman. That struggle's not over, mind you. But that's the power of people moving into action. And then we have Anaheim, a majority of a community that is Latino today, which wasn't historically. But then you have an all white police force. And then you have Disneyland, you have the Anaheim Angels, and you have the Ducks. They care more about that fucking rat than do about the community of Anaheim. The Malcolm X report stated between the period of January 1st of this year to June 30th, 120 people was murdered, either by police violence, either by some type of security guard, or under other suspicious uh, matters. 120 people. 
We have increasing poverty, ethnic and racial tension, class polarization, and an ongoing political neglect by your first black president and by those who sit on the city council. But we've seen also collective action. Occupy, of course. We've seen prisoners going on strike in, in Georgia, in California, uh, Pelican Bay. We've seen a developing prison movement come about. We've had a, a profound movement around one, one of the most central questions of any human being, and that's the right to have a home. <clears throat> With occupied homes in Minneapolis and around the country. Alex, uh, 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 Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, has, been, has become a, 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 a center of conversation and discussion and organizing. You have communities doing study groups around the book, attempting to educate a new layer of young people to organize. She places within the book the central demand of any movement that does not raise the question of mass incarceration as failing in some ways. But out of chaos comes community. In 1965, you have the Watts riots. In 1966, October, you have the development of the Black Panther Party. Coming out and looking at the international struggles abroad, the rise of the civil rights movement, a more deeper revolutionary analysis developing among young people. We can stop this. One of the first things that we can do within our movement is raise important demands. The right of community control over public safety. The taxation on Wall Street. Massive public works programs in our communities. The building of schools and hospitals. Community centers. Ending the war on drugs. Dealing with this whole question of nonviolent uh, offenders. It's not a question of putting them in prison. They need public health. It's a public health question. And a full, a full funding of public education, controlled by the community, controlled and directed by our teachers' unions who are under attack. But also we've seen the great need to fight back against the lesser of two evils with arguing for our own political party, a party of working people. We have the example in Seattle, Washington, where our commons are running. Of course, we would hope there was a much larger movement and a larger party. But because of the vacuum, our comrades had to say, no, we have to stand. We have to put particular ideas forward, socialist ideas, the struggle of, of collective action of working people. Stopping both the Democratic Party and Republican Party. In the general election that will take place in November, we're going to take on the most prominent Democrat in the state. But in order to cement any victories that we gain, we understand that this system will give us with one hand and then take it away with the other. And so we must permanently eradicate the very institutions of global capitalism and the system itself. In, on, in, in, on January 1st, there was a report that among young people and, young, uh, and African Americans, the idea of socialism is starting to resonate. Now, they may have all different types of thoughts of what that really means. We make it clear that we don't <clears throat> recognize what existed in the Soviet Union in the sense that it was a distortion of ideas of socialism. But we say now that we can have an honest and open conversation about exactly what is democratic socialism? What are those ideas? What do they represent? And for African Americans, at the center of that struggle, we've been there on the question of the ideas of socialism of revolution, of international struggle. When Mussolini went into Ethiopia on the streets of Harlem, ordinary working class people, working class black folks signed up to go to Ethiopia 
and to stop Mussolini. In the streets of Harlem, all the radical organizations centered there. We can talk about the 60s, but it dates back even further. So we're living in a time of struggle and revolution. And I want to end on this point. That the ideas of democratic socialism, the ideas of struggle, August represents all of that. All of that history. From the Haitian Revolution of 1791, to Nat Turner's rebellion in 1831, to Gabriel Prosser's uh, slave insurrection of 1800, the lynching of Emmett Till that gave rise to what we know as the Civil Rights Movement in 1955, the work of George Jackson as, as, a, as, a, uh, as a prison activist and theorist. <clears throat> We're living in beautiful times. It's a difficult road ahead, but we surely have a world to win, and we must win, because we have a generation that's looking at us. We have a historical task. Thank you.